Hi, this is a case Cornelis Morsink, and I'm from Kings Mill Cider in Stirling, Ontario. And we're located probably 30 kilometers north of Belleville, Ontario, and Trenton, Ontario. So you can kind of figure it out. So we're about 20 minutes off the 401. And uh, we have a tasting room, so you're welcome to come anytime. We're open on Saturdays and Sundays, 11 to 6. And I run uh, Kings Mill Cider with my wife, Margaret Van Hallefort, who's sitting beside me, who doesn't want to talk. <laughs> So, and now you're listening to Cider Chat. Episode 148. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Aria Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week, we are on the northern shore of Lake Ontario, in the town of Sterling. That is Sterling spelled with an I, speaking to the makers at Kings Mill Cider. There'll be more on that in just a moment. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to catch you up on what I've been doing for the past two weeks out and about in Ciderville. If you are new to this podcast, well, welcome to Ciderville. And if you're a regular listener, you know that the last two Cider Chat podcasts were episodes that I call Cider Chat Live, where I am recording almost close to real time and then uploading it to you because I've, I've been traveling. I've been overseas and the first week I was there for two weeks and the first week I landed in Amsterdam and that episode focused on touring about in the Netherlands because the Netherlands does have it going on with cider. Uh, you could land at Schiphol and go to a cider store right in Amsterdam and grab a bottle and go to the Vonde Park, which is kind of their version of a central park. And start drinking cider and enjoying the scene. Uh, we're going to be seeing more and more of that in the Netherlands. Some big news on that. The last day that I was in the Netherlands, I was on the border of Belgium at a restaurant and speaking to the manager there. And he told me that next, I think it's 2019 in Rotterdam, there's going to be a congress. That's a term that's used in Europe qu quite a bit. Uh, the comparable term would be a conference, but they call it a congress. A congress on food and gastronomic delights. And there are two main topics that are going to be spoken about at that conference. The first one's going to be on Yenever, which is only made in the Netherlands. And some people think that that is gin, but it's not really. It's really a Dutch drink that I think has been kind of tweaked out into a more gin product, and it's only made in the Netherlands. So they're going to be talking about that. That's a big thing coming up. They're going to be trying to really push that traditional Dutch drink. And guess what the second topic is? Go ahead, guess. I give you, I give you like a New York second to guess, and you know it. It's going to be cider. Uh, that just like flips me out, because it was only a short time ago, I would say it's in the past four years, four years ago, that I set up a cider meetup in Amsterdam with importers and some makers at a little sidebar that I knew who was willing to like give me the space to do really what was the first cider meetup for the Dutch. And now, just in a short window of time, they're going to be highlighting cider. And what we can expect to see in the coming year is more availability of cider because there's a lot of makers getting on it. And there, there's some are importing juice from the UK. I mean, that happens, right? It's happening in the US all over the map for sure. But they're also planting apples and do not underestimate what these folks could do. I mean, shoot, you know, the Dutch have the Delft Project, which is where they basically tamed the ocean. That's right. They, they, were even like consultants to Louisiana after the Hurricane Katrina because they have this system where they're able to open up these gates and bring in fresh ocean water to clear out this huge area that is renowned for oysters and then close it off again. And, of course, that's not good enough. They also make power doing that. So 
keep your eye on the Netherlands. I'm really excited for all the makers there and certainly for us cider fans. That is cool. So that that happened like my first week and I was working in my um, other other world of uh, psychiatric care and uh, had this kind of heavy scene where I got to see my, my dear friend and uh, one of my main instructors of my curriculum there. Uh, last year, two weeks after I left, he was uh, struck. He and his son, his six-year-old son, were struck by a drunk driver. And um, everyone thought they were going to lose lose him. Yepa is his name. And uh, miracular, miraculously, uh, well, let me put it this way. This guy is a miracle man. He, I got to see him, and he was standing up and talking and communicating. There's, he does have some traumatic brain injury, but... Oh, we wow, just the power of pure uh, strength for living. So that was pretty emotional because I was able to bring Yepa into that setting that he hadn't been in for over a year at the work site and able to fil- facilitate that. And talk about heavy. That was heavy, 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 heavy. Um, I did a lot of bike riding to work that through. So that happened for the first week. And of course, I had a lot of cider on my side and I was able to drink some local products. I have a little posting up on Instagram of a, a nice cider. You could check that out. Uh, one of the folks of that cidery uh, actually is a patron of Cider Chat, and the cidery is called Iglestat. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm going to put a leak in the show notes. I was hoping to meet with them, but it didn't work out, but I know I will because Netherlands has, has it going on, and at some point in the future... I will be leading a cider tour there, without a doubt. And it's going to be crazy, crazy fun. Uh, So stay tuned for that. Let me just take a pause here, and then I'm going to tell you what I just came home from the week after I was in the Netherlands. From the Netherlands, as many of you know, I was then going to be heading to France for the first Totally Cider Tour International. And just one word I could say about it is success. It was successful in every way and exceeded my expectations of what that trip could be. I told you a little bit about the Netherlands where it was a little bit heavy. In France, it was heavy too. And those of you following along on social media, we were able to partake on a major, a major moment I think for Cider Worldwide, when we were able to do a tribute to Jerome Dupont with his father, Etienne Dupont, at the Domaine Dupont in Pédoche. Uh, wow. Heavy, heavy duty. Uh, and part of the beauty of this podcast for me is just connecting with people like the folks who came along on the tour. They were already connected. They already knew like so much about me. And had a sense who I was. So when we all met up, it was just, it just went to figure that we all would get along. And we did. It was outstanding. We're just starting to drink cider from the morning to the evening. No one got wasted. And we were drinking a lot of cider. It was just really well paced. The food was unbelievable. My goodness. I'm, I'm just still full from all the food. Absolutely gourmet delight. Gave us a whole range of like a Norman buffet to a Michelin star experience. Uh, our last cider dinner was with Eric Bordelais. That's after hanging out in the morning with Philip, the Perry farmer, walking out in his orchard. Everyone just adored the group, all the makers that I had been cultivating uh, relationships with just flew out their doors to meet everybody on the bus. They were pumped. The people that I was traveling were with were pumped. It was just a love fest in cider. Again, beyond my my wildest expectations. Um, We were able to partake in the tribute, a toast that I asked everyone like yourself to join in on on September 25th to Jerome de Pont. We pulled into the domain on the afternoon of the 25th and it was kind of like a, a, a movie scene because if you're not aware of that domain, you enter it on this long driveway. And at the end is this 
mansion and there's like pillars and as the bus pulled up at one end we looked out the distance and we could see Jerome's father Etienne standing there and um You know, obviously, Jerome Dupont died at the age of 48, a really big loss to the family and to the world of cider because he was so innovative, really changing some of the path of Norman Ciders. And to be able to meet with his father and some of the workers there and and let them know that we're holding them in their thoughts, it was just, it was amazing. And um, he gave the family rate to everybody getting cider. That was insane the family rate meaning like a deal gave me a bottle of 45 year old calvados from domaine de pont and uh we took that bottle because the next next day i think it was wednesday evening after hanging out with the gatletier and having a norman buffet with her we went to mont saint michel which we were able to approach at low tide and of the sea the that UNESCO Heritage, World Heritage Site, and made our way, we all kind of like went our way into the the Mont St. Michel, and then met up at a high point, and did a toast, again, to Cider, to Love, to Jerome, to all the things that we care about in Ciderville. Uh, I could still taste that Calvados. Uh, walked in the orchards, where folks never ever get to go to because people were so willing to open up their doors to this cider tour. Ended up at the Musée de Poré, which I visited about two years ago, had a special tour there, and they were ecstatic because Americans had never visited there, not at that degree. Uh, Everywhere, there was just absolute happiness to be able to meet with a secret cider maker and kind of get lost with the bus. So we had that that French experience of getting lost in the country roads, which happens. Uh, Walking out and seeing my good friend Michel Darget, who was on the podcast, uh, which was called Cider uh, Behind the Scenes in Normandy, and having him help us find uh, Roland and his father Regis and mother Sylvie to be able to drink in their little tasting room that never had American visitors before. It just blew our socks off. Uh, We could have spent hours at every site because people were just so willing to share, uh, including Eric Bordelais. That was an outstanding visit with him. He has a new cider coming out. It's already out. It's out. He only made a thousand bottles. I have one here. And I'll be talking about that. So I'm trying to figure out how I do all this. I think next week I'm going to just roll out some little clippings. I'll probably put out some special things here and there. Uh, Suffice to say, I'll just leave it at this. There's going to be another side of tour to Normandy. I'm already planning it with my French counterpart. And it's going to be, again, in, in September of 2019 in that same area. Don't miss on this. This is just, will will blow your mind. We were able to be out in the pear orchards, eating these pears, having that juice, just like I imagined, dripping down, tasting a zillion different varieties of pears. I think that's really blew folks out of the water to experience Stonfront, this region that's so unknown. And then to taste cider and pore, it's just a game changer for people. So to the folks who came along on the tour with me who are listening now, I'm tapping my chest to you, closing my eyes, blowing you kisses on both sides of the cheek, and just want to thank you for making that tour so successful. It meant a lot to me, and it meant a lot to the makers and to the pear and apple trees, which are dependent on our knowledge awareness and education so that they are protected because that's a big thing going on not only in Normandy but around the world folks are finally kind of waking up and realizing that this is a national treasure at each location if not a world treasure these palms and on that same note of tours I'm going to just switch gears and remind you to sign up now for the November 1st cider tour 
heading to Vermont and New Hampshire. It takes place the day before Cider Days kicks off. So it's on a Thursday. We leave from Greenfield, Massachusetts at about 8 in the morning and return at 10 at night. It's going to be a visit to Farnham Hill with Steve Wood and the team there. Then we'll go up to Eden Cider to see Eleanor Leger. Uh, that is a renowned site for ice cider. Cruise down through Stowe for a little tasting and then have a cider dinner at Fable Farm Firmatory in their barn with a hearth. And also get to meet the maker at Tin Hat, that's Teddy Weber, and one of the oldest cideries in the country, Flag Hill Farm, Sebastian Lucader. Do I need to convince you to do this? I really hope not. Uh, And if you can't make it, please let other people know that this tour is taking place. If they are headed to Cider Days, do it. Don't miss out on these tours. They just will blow your mind. If the Normandy tour was any indication of what we could do when we come together as a collective group and have fun out there in Ciderville, do it. Go to ciderchat.com to the Totally Cider page. You'll get all the links for the reservations and sign up now. November 1st, New England Cider Tour. my little bag of crisp apple chips that Margaret of Kings Mill Cider gave to me along with some really nice other snackaroos like coconuts and some nuts which really endeared me even further to these folks that we're going to be chatting with coming up next. Ryan Monkman introduced me to these folks while I was on tour in Ontario this past June. Uh, Ryan is based in Wellington, Prince Edward County in Ontario. That's right on the shores of Lake Ontario. And you've heard a number of episodes that I've been putting out from that tour. I absolutely fell in love with my Canadian neighbors to the north. It wasn't hard to do that. I already enjoyed the Canadian sights and sceneries. And to be able to dive into their cider was an absolute treat. So again, what I'm eating here while I'm listening is crisp apple chips, which they always have at the tasting room at King's Mill Cider for the kids. And I guess Margaret saw that I was a kid at heart and she figured I could use a little bit of Snicky Snack. So I've been holding on to these until this time. And essentially it's dried apple rings. I'm putting my hand at the bag. You could hear that crumbling in the background. And a nice fruit flavored chip. I, I just love how cider makers aren't just all about the adults and drinking, but really a full family experience, which is what you will find there. Uh, We were sitting down having a conversation at this cidery that at that point was just one month old, even though it was a number of years in the making. And I could tell that Ryan was really excited to have me meet these folks. You're going to hear all about their background and a bit about their cider too. So without further delay... Let's all grab a glass and join this chat with Keys Cornelius Morsink and Margaret Van Helvoort of Kings Mill Cider, based in Stirling, Ontario. We're sitting at your your dining room table. We're looking out into your backyard on this like sloping hill. It's really green out. Uh, I see some solar panels. I see a greenhouse. Um, seeing over there, that looks like like a little nursery orchard. Is that? Yeah, true? We have a orchard that's about uh, two to three years old. The mm. trees, and we have about seven hundred trees now. So we also did grafts last year, which didn't turn out too well, but we did all right. We did a lot of Kingston blacks and 
and the Arlington Mills and Brown Snouts and different uh, apples more from and Michelin, Michelin and Fricard Rouge, so from France and from mm -hmm. uh, and from Britain. So we're mm -hmm. trying to get a more tannic apple, mm -hmm. which are very hard to find on the market here locally. So, but we do find heritage apples. So we also have uh, russets planted. We have Tolman sweets. We have wine saps. And uh, which was my mother's favorite apple, so and russet, so that's where I got into that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a Northern Spy and a few Macintosh, Ambrosia, a few different trees like that that we planted. Mm -hmm. So next year we're looking to get into different uh, different trees again, more tannic apples, because we can get the other apples on the market locally here. Mm -hmm. So, so you this is a new orchard. How, how are they doing in this climate and soil and culture and you know the the any kind of disease that you're seeing? How's that going? We had a lot of problems with uh, apple rust. Mm -hmm. So we had two very bad years. The first year we planted, so that was in 2016. But, and can we just say what apple rust is for folks who are just cider drinkers? They have no idea. Yeah, it's a, a fungal that comes from a comes from the juniper tree, so what do they call the red cedar, which is really a juniper, and it's a secondary host, so it produces a, it looks like a gel, gel with this little I call it uh, an ugly little spore maker that uh, <laughs> that actually infects the trees, the apple trees. It affects the leaves, so the leaves brown out and fall off, mm. and uh, so you don't get much growth. So that's the biggest problem we had. How do you so deal with it? We have to uh, spray with a fungus fungicidal type mm -hmm. spray, which we're doing just because uh, we have no choice. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't like to spray much. But we're mm -hmm. we're thinking about doing sprays there. But as soon as the apples start growing, we're not spraying the apples. Yeah. So we're staying away from that. So we're doing a an integrated pest management and fungal management. So just the minimal sprays we can use. So we tried it with no sprays for two years and it was a disaster. So the first mm -hmm. year in 2016, we had a drought. So we had about uh, 400, 500 trees at that time. We were watering them by hand. So we because you had, had no irrigation. We had set no up. irrigation set up. So you don't get enough rain up here. In we had a drought one year. It was very funny. Oh. So sixteen, we had a drought, and wow. then seventeen last year, we had tons of rain, so much yeah. rain, and that's when the rust really came out. Okay. So we had a lot of problems with that, mm -hmm. and uh, we haven't had that many pest problems. We're trying to keep that under control by even picking off pests by hand. So mm -hmm. we do that. We go around all the trees and and try to clean them up as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's been a challenging when it was drought because we have kids too and they didn't want to really they got sick of watering with us so, that's a lot know, of trees to, a lot of trees to water cool. so we're just pulling with a small tractor this year we have a larger tractor so uh so we have different ways of doing things so scaling we're, up we're scaling up and we're improving slowly but it's yeah. uh you know it takes time we've been open a whole month so far you know so we opened, i know uh, April I, I, 21st. I heard that congratulations <laughs> thank you very much that's so, super exciting right yeah. but so but it takes so i think for folks listening, it's kind of important to know that if you want to make cider, it doesn't just happen like boom overnight, like a brewery. You get the equipment, you put your order in for the hops and the malt, you know, and the, or the grain or whatever, and then you're good to go. Not that it's that easy either, but when you are dealing with the orchard-based cidery or apples in general, there is a long... Uh, how, how long has it taken for you to We've start been... from the, the conception of the idea? The conception of starting a business has probably been about four years. Mm -hmm. So we've probably been brewing for about six, or fermenting for about six mm -hmm. in the basement. Mm -hmm. But it's been longer than that. I've actually been, uh, my first spontaneous ferment was 40 years ago, when I was going to Mennonite school. We all received uh, a, a gallon jug of apples, apple juice, that was pressed for, for the school. Wow. And I put it in my locker, and it fermented. <laughs> so that was the first time I fermented any uh, any apples. So, so it's been forty years in the making. So for sure, it's only been a month in the opening, but forty years in the making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your soil like? Here, it's pretty. It's clay. We have limestone too. A lot of limestone underneath. Yeah. So we're actually looking at grapes at one time, but it's a bit too far away from the lake. So it's a bit too cold. Okay. So and that's why we we're getting more into uh, the apples. And we want to get the mm. cider. I've been into fermentation a long time. We lived in Africa for 10 years, so Margaret and I, and uh, we were working for the UN, so we did eight, we were working on eight projects. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we were doing, uh, we were making our own yogurt, we were uh, sauerkraut, and we were brewing ourselves, mm -hmm. and brewing different things, so. And then the Comoro Islands, I also uh, did a lot of fermentation of, uh, of mangoes and uh, raspberries and uh, we did some distilling there, since they distill Lang Lang oil, so they had stills, so we were doing some stilling, distilling, so we did mango eau de vie, which is delicious. Oh my goodness, so, wow, I can only imagine. Yeah, so mango. We, mm. 
They have a lot of fun. I love mangoes. So Me it's one of my too. favorite fruits. Oh, I wish they could grow where we Alphons live. Alphonse. Mm. And, oh. and the Comoros had at least 40 different types of mangoes. So it was incredible. Wow. Who knew? Yeah. Like so, apples. Like apples. There's just tons of different kinds of mangoes. Yeah. So. Yeah. I imagine they have heritage mangoes too, like they have. Mm-hmm. Possibly. Yeah. So, right. Wow. So yeah. that's fascinating. Are you still working for the UN? Uh, not anymore. So we're just, uh, we have our own uh, jewelry business. So mm-hmm. we're actually doing that. And that's what kind of pays for the cider business at the mm-hmm. moment as it, as it takes on. And we're looking at the cider business as more of a retirement business. So okay. I do a lot of traveling. So I'm traveling to India, Nepal, and uh uh, Thailand and the little for the jewelry for the jewelry business. So, so are, you're not making the jewelry, but you are importing jewelry. What we do is we actually um, we I'm also a prospector miner, so we actually do stones here. And uh, stone cutting is no longer happening in North America. Mm-hmm. People don't cut stones into cabochons and things like that. Yeah. So we have it done overseas. So we cut plates here. And then we draw it out, and then we have the uh, the stones cut and ground for us there, and then set it to jewelry, and then we bring it back. Cool. So if folks want to see your jewelry, is there like an online um, uh, way that they could? Yeah, I think Nir- nirvanagift.com. Nirvanagift.com. Yeah, okay. so they have stuff there. But we're okay. wholesalers mostly, so that's a retail site, but we sell the stores. That's what we do. I see. So, and that's why we can still do the cider. We have time because we can make our own hours. Got so it. it's very nice. Cool. Because there's some days when you, you're out there for 14, 16 hours, you know, just uh, either bottling or filtering or, or those long-term type of endeavors that uh, that take place in cider making. So. Right. Case just handed me this uh, nice list of all the different things that you're making currently, and the top one is a premium. Is this, are, are we looking at like a, you know, we often use the term flagship or like one, that style that you're always going to try to... Have available. Yeah, what we're doing is our premium, premium dry, and hopped. Those would be more commercial brands. Mm-hmm. So, and those will be sold in, in in kegs and bottles. We do it all in seven fifty mil bottles, and uh, so it's, it looks more like a wine bottle. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're doing now. We're doing still cider at the moment. We will be doing carbonated. We have. Uh, we're getting in the equipment for carbonated now. A so, bright tank. Yeah, so we're we'll getting in a bright tank hopefully soon, and we have another. Uh, Another little machine we can carbonate with, so that mm-hmm. someone made for us in Walkerton, Ontario, mm-hmm. and uh, so we we'll carbonating kegs there, and then um, so those are, are more our commercial type ciders, mm-hmm. and then we have and we're also ginger has been very popular, so we're probably going to do a ginger later too, and then we have our driest one which is a scrumpy, so I had a uh, some English friends that asked me to make a scrumpy, so we, mm-hmm. we did it without the apple floating in it and that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. a little bit cleaner, so it's actually filtered, and uh, but it's still scrumpy-ish. So we were very lucky to get uh, some experimental apples from the Ontario government, and those uh, we used to make the scrumpy, so it's a bit more tannic and wow. uh, extremely bone dry. And we also did a scrumpy uh, malolactic fermentation. So we did two different ones just to experiment and, and see how it went, and they both turned out very well. Good. Congratulations. Can, Thank you. Can, I just want to take a pause there on from the Ontario government. What was that, or what is that set up? Are they what? doing out of a university, or what? Well, what they've done, they've given uh, different trees to orchard, orchards all around Ontario. So they have the trees, and then they find out the re- reactions of how the, okay. the apple's growing, how it's mm-hmm. doing. So uh, Ryan and I were pressing with uh, someone we know here in, uh, in the county. And uh, they had the apples there, so we got the apples from them. Oh, so it turned out very wow, well. So, wow! So hopefully, that will in the future we'll have a lot more of these type of apples coming in. But right now, it's very difficult to get um, non just the basic apples here in Ontario. So it's happening. It's the same problem they have in, uh, in the, in the US, states. Yeah, everywhere. But New York is a bit uh, yeah. further ahead than us, of course. But uh, yeah. So. Wow, that's exciting. That's that's. I always love to hear how the government is supporting. A, a really farm-based product. It just yeah. makes absolute sense. Well, here in Ontario, they've been very, very good. They're actually, there's going to be a kickback, too, where we get uh, 70 cents a litre for every litre we sell. So they're really promoting cider in Ontario. And it's just helped the farmers. The farmers had all these apples they couldn't sell anymore. Um, yeah. Most of the people pulled out all their, their apples in the 1980s as the Chinese concentrate came in and kind of killed the market. Yeah. So it's just, we're, we're trying to work with the farmers and what they have and then make cider out of that. Mm. So I know mm. when we took a, I met Ryan at the course at Cornell, and uh, there they said, uh, you know, what is a good cider, or what is a good cider apple? It's the one you have. Mm-hmm. So you have to really play with it and take everything you can out of that apple. And that's what we've been trying to work with. Right on. 
Now, uh, just again, the course at Cornell was with the Peter Mitchell uh, course. Was that true, or was I that took a... the second Peter Mitchell course. The one we took was with uh, was Chris. What was the last name? Geller. Geller. Chris Geller. Oh, okay. So we took the course with him, and then I took the Peter Mitchell course last year, mm. the science and production course. Okay. And how how many Canadians were in that course? I think four or five. Four or five. Yeah, Canadians. we're pretty well represented nice. in everything. I saw it at Lincap too. Like there was a lot of Ontario uh, judges there. There was, so, yeah. and that was very happy for me because I was like, "Oh, look at that Canada in the house." Yeah, I'm not going to speak much on this, but I'm going to interject with this. That's Ryan Monkman talking. CiderCon, 2019. We're doing the Canadian consulate party, so we're going to get a hotel room. It's going to be Nanaimo bars, tragically hip Favorite. on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can haul in some beaver tails. <laughs> oh my goodness. Butter tarts. Butter tarts. Oh my that goodness. We'll on a Chesterfield. We'll see. Exactly. That's, that was, that's, what, uh, that's what, what Kat said yesterday. Is we'll, we'll, we'll pull out the couch and replace it with the Chesterfield. <laughs> now, I don't know what all these references are, but I'm very curious to find out. This is a little Easter egg for your Canadian listeners. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. And, and we adore all the Canadian listeners. But I'm most ex- I think beaver tails would pair very well with Saturn. That's it. Oh, actually eating beaver tails. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a kind of donut. Oh. <laughs> you have to know. <laughs> okay. I won't tell what a Chesterfield is. <laughs> Are you serious? Like, people actually eat a beaver tail? Or is this it's, a joke? Do you know what an elephant ear is? I, I know what an elephant's ear is, like, but... Like the, the pastry? It's, uh, it's fried, yeah. it's fried oh, dough okay. coated in sugar. Okay, yeah. yeah. We call them beaver tails. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, they're, okay. They're delicious. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Carny food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's one thing that I adore about uh, Canada and Canadians is the sense of humor, the quality of food, the congeniality. It's really a, a treasure of a country. And I, I, I feel very happy that you're such a close neighbor. And I really feel thrilled to be here and have this opportunity. It's really amazing. So, we'll look forward to that inside of The Canadian Consulate. The yeah, Canadian, Canadian Consulate. Consulate. Okay, happening. So, we're talking about Scrumpy. Yeah. Um, and then we did another one, Arrested. So, the Scrumpy is more an English-style yeah. cider. And yeah. then we went to a French-style cider, and that was we called Arrested Development. Mm-hmm. Because there we stopped the, the fermentation at a certain point, and we left a little bit of sweetness in it. So, and it's actually quite nice. And I see that you have it described as calm sweetness balanced with firm acidity. You have a nice play with words. Yeah, that's very inviting. I can thank uh, Margaret and oh. Karina oh. for doing that. Very they worked on, uh, on most of the, the tasting notes and things like that. Great, so. that's lovely. And then it goes on with floral, naturally off dry cider, great thirst quencher. And that's the arrested de- development. That's 10% alcohol by volume. And that's what I see here is your highest ABV on, on the list here. That, yeah. Really uh, well, well named too. Arrested yeah. Development. Yeah. So you know, watch out for those ten percenters. They are often very sneaky. They are. They People are. don't realize that it tastes so. You know, because it's uh, so well integrated. The alcohol yeah. with the taste. So yeah. it's, uh, cool. Yeah. Cool. And you have ice cider. We have ice cider. So we started our. our we went pretty well with our first vintage. So we uh, we did ice cider. We did it in barrels outside. So what we did, we brought in about a thousand liters. It was just an experiment. And we didn't do the, we didn't press apples the way it was. We, we did it from juice. Yeah. So we did it from juice. And then Margaret and I were out there at uh, two and three o'clock in the morning, scooping uh, slush off the top till it mm-hmm. froze. We brought it down to about uh, 250 liters. And then we started fermenting. So we started the fermentation and nothing was happening at first. So it was just because it was so thick and going on. I took off to India and I got this call when I was in India. It's going everywhere. <laughs> and so Ryan came in to help Margaret. And I guess it was just flying everywhere. It fermented. We were lucky. We had it in smaller containers, 300, uh, no, 100 liter bins, stainless steel bins. Mm-hmm. So Margaret, with the girls, pulled it out on the porch. And this was during the winter. So it was uh, about negative 20. And then she packed it with ice. <laughs> And then uh, it slowed down after two or three days. It was still fermenting for two or three days out in that cold. So yeah. and then I came back and uh, it had stopped at exactly the place I wanted to stop. So it was just a miracle. So it was fermenting. <laughs> you had the juice come in, and you had the juice 
It, it froze naturally outside. When you said in barrels, what do you mean? Well, we did we did in smaller. We did in two hundred two hundred liter barrels. Okay. So we had six barrels out there. So with that, we could control it. So we could because normally getting yeah. it in totes. Not most of the people do it in large totes uh, and then bring the tote yeah. and pull it in. Yeah. But we wanted to get right in. So we were gassing it every day. So we were CO two ing it. Just we had small holes in the size of the barrel. Okay. So we kept a nice gas plastic flow, barrels. plastic barrels. Yeah. And then it was out there for about uh, about three weeks. And we brought it down to a uh, about thirty one bricks, and then uh, did you did when you um, did you pitch yeast to this or yes you did yeah so you pitched yeah. it before it froze so we yeah we picked two different yeast okay because so. that's a little bit different yeah. isn't it uh, with like there's a lot of different ways to make ice cider yeah. like folks will just take the juice and freeze the juice mm -hmm. and then ferment that juice. Yeah. But you had pitched the yeast well, beforehand. We, no, we, we didn't know. We oh, actually, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. That's, okay. that's a mistake. Okay. So we did actually pitched the juice after it was right. condensed. Okay. So, okay. And then we did a cold soak. Yeah. One yeast cold soak. And then we did another yeast. And then we happened to have a garage yeast that we call it. So there's a spontaneous yeast happening in our garage, which is happening right now. So there's, uh, we have some two different ciders going, three different ciders going right now. And, uh, there's something in there that's doing so. We, we're putting in two yeasts, and we're getting a third yeast. So it's building complexity into the ciders, yeah. which has been a lot of fun. So yeah, yeah, they're they're. Those and it's are... a nice yeast. It's a, it's a good yeast. Oh, it's, good. It's, it's a friendly yeast. Oh, good. Oh. Yeah, I haven't met a, a, a unfriendly yeast, but I, I know they're out oh, there. They're I suppose. out there. They're, they're out there. <laughs> yeah, they try to stay away from all my wild yeast. <laughs> Anyways, um, so cold soak. What, what do you mean by cold soak? Well, we used a um, this time we used uh, a Gaia, which is just a. a a yeast that will start fermenting at about two degrees, but it doesn't uh, two degrees uh, Celsius. So sorry, mm -hmm. I know you guys speak in Fahrenheit. So yes, about, we do. Yeah. about thirty-seven, something like that. Thirty-five, thirty-six. Mm -hmm. so, Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fahrenheit. So then, uh, and that way, it doesn't really produce much alcohol. Mm -hmm. So it just, but it does. It protects the uh, protects the cider against any kind of uh, vinegary type yeast that are coming in. Mm. It dominates that way. Mm -hmm. So it's more stable and it gives a lot of mouth feel and uh, we've mm. had very good luck with that. So we played mm. with that and then we put in our other yeast after a few days and then another yeast uh, came and took over that. So Yeah, you're building been... up the yeast tolerance for the alcohol level. That's, Is that, that's what you're working with. And how do you stop fermentation on, on the ice cider? Because that's a, a difficult, you know, yeah. folks listening out there in cider are like, Oh, I try it, and, and then all of a sudden it's like bottle popping, you know? No, no we... Um, sparkling. We brought it outside. It was cold enough just to stop it outside, and then we had to... We bent with it, and we had to put a bit of sulfur in there to, okay. to make sure it stayed. Yeah. And then we bottled it fairly quickly, and we went through a, a whole filtration system. We went first through a 580 pads, 350 pads, 170 pads, and then we sterile filtered it after that. So, and that's how we really removed all okay. the yeast and everything else. Yeah, so, yeah. Because it does, it started re-fermenting a bit again, just mm -hmm. even the, the day from when we brought it inside to just when we had to transfer it over to mm -hmm. get bottled, it was, mm -hmm. uh, so you have to watch out. It, it's very mm -hmm. fast because the sugar content is so high, it will start re-fermenting, especially yeah. with our garage yeast here. We have yeah. to watch out with him, so our her, whatever it is. So. Do you do any oaking with the ice cider? Or? No, we haven't yet, but yeah. uh, we don't have that much room. That's the problem. Mm. We're, we're dealing, uh, you'll see that we're dealing out of our house. We're dealing out of an eight. 100 square foot garage at the moment, mm -hmm. and uh, we have about 12,000 liters capacity in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're getting more equipment. We want to get some chillers and things like that. So, so we're working on that at the moment. So then we could, with a chiller, stop the fermentation that way too. Sure. But that's all more equipment we have to buy yeah. and things like that. So yeah. it's one month. You've only started one month. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed at the list of ciders that you have. Is <clears throat> Pretty dandy here. Yeah, I mean, especially nice ice cider. Yeah, that's the first one I've seen in the the tour about that we've been doing. I should um, try it. It's really good. Oh, I'd love it's it. really good. Yeah, um, that is super neat, and it's eight point five percent. Yes, which is uh, you know a, a little bit on the lower side of uh, a nice cider. Yeah. So no, we wanted to go a little bit lower, and then uh, not as thick and and, 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 and the like viscosity this ice, is yeah. not like yeah heavy of, duty legs. Yeah, a lot of people complain about the ice wine. They're saying it's just too thick, too sweet, uh -huh. and stuff. Uh -huh. So we we actually threw quite a bit of acidity in there to uh, we put a lot of mac into and northern spy to bring out the acidity. Nice. So that kind of balanced it really well. Oh, so exciting! So it's, it's it's a little. Let's say it's it's not as sweet, and the acidity balances very very well. Mm. So it's turned out very nice. Cool. Cool. Well, what a 
awesome list here. So I'm counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 ciders. In well, a month. Uh, one ice cider. What's that? Ed? In a month. In a month. <laughs> I know. I know it took, it took a more than, than a month, <laughs> but I mean, that that's pretty righteous. Um, let, let's just talk, too, about the name of your cider, because I'm always kind of curious about yep. that. King's Mill Cider, your logo is an apple with uh, one little green leaf, and then there's the crown, the crown that I'm kind of seeing on the highways, mm-hmm. right? You want to say so, more about that? King's Mill Cider, we're living on King's Mill Road hmm. at this moment, mm-hmm. so that's what our address is. It's 596 King's Mill Road, mm-hmm. Sterling, Ontario. And we have a cider mill, or not a cider mill, but we have a mill right around the corner here within one kilometer. And that's on the back of our other labels. You'll see, I'll show you okay. later. And it's sure. got the painting of the mill. So the the logo, the apple, what we wanted to do originally, we wanted to get a real apple and have it cut with a crown. But I couldn't find anybody to do it that exact. So it's very hard. Yeah, yeah. So we had a friend of ours, uh, Karina, who did uh, a lot of our work, and she painted this for us. So we had the original in the, in the room, I'll show you, and the original painting of the mill. Yeah. So And she's been doing all our, our graphic work for us. She's a great... Uh, She's actually a landscaper. She has a landscape company. So unfortunately for the summer, we're, we don't have her. She's busy doing other things. But she'll be back in the in the winter, fall, winter. So nice, working with nice, us again. And it's good. been a great... We, we've met so many local people and so many local people have been involved. Mm-hmm. So it's been very nice. Mm-hmm. So here we have... Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah. It, it, we've been very lucky. Uh, Margaret and my girls have been working for the Cooney Apple Farm, which is right down the road here for the last 10, more than that almost 15 years. So we've had a connection to an apple farm here for 15 years, and they've helped us with pressing. If we have any juice that has to be stored, they have freezers and cold rooms, they've been helping us with that. So we have to thank them from the bottom of our hearts because it's really, without them, we wouldn't be here. So it's just, and and they've been very, very kind to us. And generally Mm -hmm. the whole area has been very, very good and very supportive. Mm -hmm. Like I said, our grand opening, we had between five and 700 people come. So, and that's just a local a small town. A month ago. A month ago. A month ago. ago. Wow. And here we're living in Sterling, a population of 1,500 people. And we're six <laughs> kilometers north of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, we're, we're talking like we're in the middle of nowhere. In our whole area here, Hastings County, I think there's, what is it? No, Sterling Road, there's 5,000 people. <laughs> and that goes from, uh, it must be across, be almost uh, 70 miles by... 70 miles like it's just it's it's a large area so it's mostly uh-huh. farms yeah. and uh, that's another thing we want to work with there's a lot of old abandoned orchards in the area so we are we've been doing a lot of picking and finding of apples here and uh so we want to work with that of course you know? yeah so i found some good spitters very bitter apples and Ooh, things like that so bonus so that'll be coming out uh, next year so we'll be working go into others yeah. we love to blend we love to play yeah. So that's the main thing. And that's what cider, we enjoy so much about cider, that it gives you the room to play. Like, there's so many different things you can do with cider. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's been very exciting for us. And we like to experiment, so that's, uh, that's yeah. been very nice. No doubt, no doubt. Well, should we go down and look at your, your tasting room? We'd and would love get, you to come. Should chat about that? And... Sure. We are walking. Um, oh, on the other side of the house here. Entrance here. Entrance uh, uh, directly off the driveway, coming out to a, um, a live edged bar table in the tasting room. What kind of tree is that? This is pine. Mm. And uh, I was driving, I was going to buy a stainless steel sink for the uh, for the cider house. Mm-hmm. And a guy had this leaning against his, uh, mm. against his barn. So It's like a three inch slab there? Yep, I think it's uh, two and a half. A two and a half, half. Yep. okay. Yep. All right, yeah, pretty so, close. I had to melt so it down. We just cleaned it off and melted it down, and we took off the bark mm-hmm. because there was little bugs underneath the bark, unfortunately, so we had to clean that up. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that could be the one bugs eating it. Mm, that's so, lovely. So it's only been here for that's eight months, I think, so we're letting it crack. So there's, there's a crack here, we want to let it crack, and we're going to sand it again, work on it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm, get really that all cool. Yeah, so you have this, and then Behind on the wall are the bottles presentation, some bicycles up there. Those don't look like Dutch bicycles to me though. Like they're the way the seat is kind of leaned back, yeah. you know, that kind of uprightness. They were made in Indonesia, so they're probably originally with the Dutch influence, but made in Indonesia, mm. I think. Yeah. So yeah. And those ones are from India. Mmm, all these like little yeah, bicycles piece. Yeah. I love it. So we're here in the tasting room and then we could come right over here and this is just so neat. You can look right into the cidery. Uh, looks like variable tanks there, right? Yep, we have variable tanks. We have from uh, and we have a few uh, milk tanks. 
they're the long tanks and uh, they've been great for fermentation. And then uh, we're getting a couple other tanks coming in, a Bright's tank and another tank later, so we're working on that now. Nice setup. Yeah. Wow, so that's... We'll, we'll go inside and take a look. You can do bottom. a lot in there. We can do almost 12,500 liters. So it's uh, awesome. So right now there's about, uh, let's see, the 2,000, 3,000, there's about uh, 6,000 liters going on in there at the moment. Here we're part of the uh, Craft Association of Ontario. And what happens here, we're only allowed to use Ontario products. Our local neighbors here, Small Spade Farms, which is about two kilometers from here, they grew the ginger for us. Nice. So they grew it in greenhouses. Ginger. Wow. Local ginger in wow. greenhouses. Yeah. And then the hops are also local that we use. So we're using all local products. I'm working on a mojito right now, so I'm making some bitters myself, so out of roots and that. So wow. I'm playing around with that, and it's actually worked out pretty good. So good, good, yeah. I'm quite surprised. And we're growing the mint, so we have a large garden here. Mm -hmm. So we have rhubarb there, so we'll be a uh, rhubarb mm -hmm. cider. I've done a few rhubarb ciders, and I wasn't thrilled with them. Oh, interesting, but, yeah. yeah. But I'm going to play with the little different amounts and different things going on. And we're growing some lemon balm, so we can get that lemon flavor, because we can't uh, use lemons in Ontario either. So it's uh, using lemon balm to kind of get that lemony. Yeah, thing. so that's yeah. what I'll use for that. So. Well, that's an interesting way for a country to kind of deal with that, or, you know, I don't know if that's true across the board of Canada. Is that true? Well, I just know Ontario. Okay. So I think All it's right. a distance we're yeah. part. And it's just, it's a volunteer thing. Like, we, we could, you could actually you could. throw it in, and then oh. you just pay a higher rate with, uh, with excise, Canada right. excise for duty. But uh, we'd rather keep it uh, local. Yeah. I, I like the idea of local. It's fun. Yeah. You because know, if we expand too, the idea of this is to start a cidery and then later on in, improve it and have some growth and then hire local people. Like we're living in a very depressed area here. Mm. So it would be really nice to hire some local people. Yeah, get some so, work. Yeah. So the mayor's been talking to us, the warden and, and different people like that. So they've all been talking, they've all been super the interested. The warden, is there a, a prison? No, maybe? the warden is a, a person that watches all the different townships. Oh, so it's just okay. uh, so you have a category. I like yeah, this category. So you have mayor, yeah. and then you have uh, of the area like that, and then you have a warden who watches over the whole area. I see. And he's also our neighbor over here. So and the warden, mayor, he's both our mayor and warden. I love it. And yeah. uh, he also owns the Cooney Apple Store. So oh, so they have the apple farm, that? and that's how we got connected with him through the apples. Yeah. And the first thing he did, he came over and he bought two cases of cider to give to all the different uh, people in. Sterling, so Love. it worked out really yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cool. Well, can we try a little bit of cider here? So, so this is your tasting glasses yeah. here. So what would you like to try? Yeah. Well. Um, As you might suspect, Ciderville, I ended up trying all the ciders there at Kings Mill Cider that day. Cause shoot, I was coming all the way from my spot of Ciderville, all the way up to Canada. You bet I wasn't going to go home without a try of each of those. I had the, the main flagship, which is a premium and premium dry and the hop ginger. There's also the hop cider and then a straight up ginger. Remember that ginger is locally sourced as is the hops. And he uses a cascade and pearl mix of hops. Those main ciders are all 9% alcohol by volume. There's also the Russet Heritage and a Scrumpy, an Arrested Development, which comes in at 10%. Woo! No wonder it's called Arrested Development. Uh, but yet, you wouldn't know that it's so high ABV. So, you're forewarned. Watch out. Make sure you bring a bottle of that home. There's Ice Cider. Mm, it was so tart and really fruit forward. I have a bottle of that sitting for me right now that I'm going to be cracking open as soon as I get this finally edited for you. And that comes in at 8.5%, which is a nice balance for an ice cider. In fact, go to the show notes for this here episode 148 and you'll get to see the process that they were doing to make that ice cider. Then there's also the MLF Scrumpy. And I'm not sure if they have any more of that left because it's a limited edition. But that's malolactic fermentation of that scrumpy, so it's a very nice mouthfeel for that cider and super low acid because of the malolactic fermentation. And to make it even better, if you can't get there, they actually have an online store, so you could have it delivered to your front door. You'll see the link in the show notes for this here episode 148. I'd like to thank Ryan Monkman for bringing me to Kingsmill Cider and introducing me to these wonderful people. 
Again, Margaret sent me on the road with these like lovely little apple chips that they give to the kids and some other little snick snacks. And Case was just such an informative man with quite the little radio voice, right? They're doing some fine things here. We were able to then walk into their cidery and take a look around. And in a small area, you could just see the wonders of Ciderville when you get some really intelligent people just doing it yourself, doing like, I think he said, hmm, 12,000 lead or something like that that he's doing in that cidery. That's, that's something, huh? Really kicking it out. Thanks again to Case and Margaret and to Ryan Monkman for bringing me up on that side of tour to Ontario and that region. Make sure you look those folks up next time you're up in Prince Edward County, Ontario. Well, that was fun, and I'm so glad I was able to bring that chat to you. I have one more chat from that trip that will be coming up shortly on a new episode of Cider Chat, so stay tuned. There is more coming from Ontario. Actually, there is so much more coming from Ontario. I am planning on doing a tour there. Uh, This is the way it rolls, Ciderville. you got to keep on going out to Ciderville to taste the cider with the maker, smell the terroir, and get into the groove. Uh, Again, upcoming Cider Tour, November 1st, New England, heading to New Hampshire and Vermont. Don't miss it. Sign up. Time is running out. We're less than a month away. Tick tock, tick tock. You know you're going to Cider Days. You do not want to miss out on that, that all weekend festival with the Cider Salon. There's some tickets for sale but tickets are running out for some of those events so get on it don't delay and uh for me i wouldn't be here this week or every week if it wasn't for the support of patrons of cider chat you could become a patron too by going to the cider chat patreon page you could google it or find a link at ciderchat.com there are some critical cider makers i want to thank for that and that would be Ironbark Cider Works on California and Claremont. Current Cider, which is based in Percocy, Pennsylvania, and has a cider bar in Fishtown, Philadelphia. Then going out to Ross Cider Company in the UK in Herefordshire. Big tip of the glass to those folks. They're always like doing such good positive cheer in the UK out there. I really, really love that area. And I'm getting it together for a cider tour there. Scrambling, folks. I am scrambling. (laughs) And then there's also a Ramborn Cider Company in Luxembourg. That is just a stone's throw from Germany. Definitely something you should visit if you are in that area. And I also want to give a shout out to John Edwards, who is an outstanding gentleman. He is a man behind a process and analytical NMR services. Did that workshop on the chemical fingerprints for cider helping you analyze cider. So check that out. There's a link in the show notes. Now, those are the main supporters currently of Cider Chat of Patreon. I could use some more for sure. So if you are a commercial maker and you believe that this is worth your time, please sign up today and help keep a cider going up around the world. Uh, I'm at a transitional page right now in my life where I'm, you know, kind of like a startup cidery. And um, my service to you is a full cup of knowledge on cider events and news and hopefully inspiration too. So sign up to become a patron. It would mean a lot. Even if you aren't a commercial maker, if you just sign up for three bucks a month, that would, if everybody who listened right now, the number of downloads that are coming in are just like crazy. If every one of those folks sign up for $3, I would be able to sleep at night. So (laughs) at least I think it's worth your time because you've been spending so much time with me. Uh, But alas, it is time to roll out of here and uh, start filling my glass with some of that nice ice cider from Kings Mill Cider. 
Mm-mm. Can't wait. This is Real Wind Caller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. I'm kind of curious about this. I don't know if you know anything about this, Ryan, but you know, the oxidation of cider once it's open. Because I, you know, I always have all these projects in my refrigerator. Mm-hmm. And I'll go back and it still tastes good. In fact, it's even getting better. That's it. So what's going on there? What's the difference? Yeah, so it depends on the apples you're using. So if you're using apples with more tannin, that's those tannins are going to protect it in the bottom of course, as yeah. well. Yeah. So that's the big thing that's helping you on the oxidation part. Yeah. The but you have are a high tannin wine, and yeah. you still... It, the, well, high tannin wines can last a couple days, but then that tannin, tannin starts to bind, and they kind of lose that, that character. Mm. But the apple, when you start to oxidize some of the tannin, you can kind of release some of the fruit aroma, too. So Ooh. it's like kind of a two-phase thing. I, I've been wondering about that. It's not something that we've really talked about, but there's, there's something going on there, because a lot of people... Well, do I have to drink that whole bottle? Mm-hmm. Especially when they buy a whole 750 ml. You don't have to. That's it. It could, it could last for a while, especially with the screw cap, which is great. It's another bonus. Of the it cider. is. It it's is. a huge bonus. Yeah. I mean, really huge. Because well, wine does have that thing, like my brother always would say, if you open that bottle of wine, you got to drink it. That's which it. put me under a lot of pressure. <laughs> 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 you know those big brothers. That That's it. Like, <laughs> what can I say? He gave me lots of good advice. So. Put it down the There we go. Yeah.